Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. Clayton here from XY Advisor. Stephen, uh, CEO of Fasia, is kind enough to swing by and have a conversation. Thanks for coming in. Pleasure to be here, Clayton. Um, so, pretty big deal, this whole Fasia thing, isn't it? Um, it's, yeah, it's a very important um, piece of reform for the, the financial advice industry. Yeah. Looking to take it forward in a, in a, a way of becoming a, you know, a trusted profession going forward. Yeah, if you go onto the website, it, it very specifically says, you know, uh, that FASIA was built to enhance trust in financial planning from from the public's point of view. And I think, uh, you know, anything with that in mind, in fact, that's a very similar uh, reason why XY Advisor exists. Um, because financial advice sort of operates in a, in a strange world where it straddles uh, quantitative and qualitative and uh, one doesn't work without the other and we sort of had a history of financial advice that was based out of you know uh, risk sales and then it sort of slowly has uh, matured and we've gone through FOFAR and LIF and there's obviously been a bunch of things right but uh, from your point of view do you see FASIO as sort of the the line in the sand is saying everything that's come before this has been attempting to solve the problem in the wrong way, but this is actually the step into professionalism. Yeah, I look at FASIA and the part of the reason that, that I joined as it is an opportunity for um, a very important industry to professionalise. Um, it's a really important industry for consumers in Australia now, if you think about, and I, I always put this in terms of, for example, in a superannuation context, you think the balances that people are going to start coming out with from superannuation, they need financial advice in the future, in good financial advice. And the, the foundations on which the uh, FASIA legislation is built, in my view, help to provide that. Um, if you think them through, it's, it's lifting standards on ethics, education, and, and mainly around the behavioural parts of the advisors, which I think is really important in generating trust to get people to use an advisor in the future. Yeah, the numbers that will, you know, you, I, I mean, first of all, you were the GM of APRA for, that was your last role, right? That's correct. Which is going to put you in very much a, a position of authority where if anything about superannuation comes up, but certainly there's what, 2.9 trillion now, it's on its way up to 7.5 or whatever in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, so I guess from your point of view, you're saying you're really aware of the need for advice. And if we're going to, I guess, tick over into professionalism, uh, now's the time. I agree. And I think, I mean, it is a real opportunity for advisors um, to generate confidence in what they do. Uh, I, I look at it in terms of if you look at what came out of a lot of the inquiries that we've had in recent times of what's gone wrong in various areas, and it's not just advice, but various areas, it's, it's driven by two things in my head. One was the structural part, and, and we talk a lot about the structures of businesses that led to that. The other is actually the behavioural pieces. So the two, it doesn't happen unless the two work together, and, and, and I look at FASIA as something that helps to educate advisors on what's the, what is the right thing to do to put client interest first, and that helps probably take away some of that stuff that happened in the past and I think will give greater confidence to consumers to actually use an advisor into the future. Yeah. Um, before we had the chance to catch up, I, I went out to my network, which is 
full of financial planners um, from all different sort of aspects. And I asked them, you know, what would you ask Stephen, right? So I had uh, multiple different questions come in. Yep. And what was really cool is I was able to sort of send them to Bruce and he, he goes, well, actually, a lot of these are beyond the scope of fascia. So I'd like to just right now uh, ask you a couple of really quick questions and you just let me know yep. if this is outside of your scope. Okay. So first thing is uh, the board appointees. Obviously, there's a, there's a little bit of kerfuffle in the air about uh, there not being enough uh, FP experience on the board. I, I believe it's two out of three and there's missing one. Are you in a position or is FASIA in a position to add another member to the board? No, FASIA doesn't have the role to add members to the board. The board's uh, appointed by government. Um, and the structure of the board is, is through the Constitution and the Corps Act in that there are to be three, as you say, advisor type uh, industry reps. Uh, three consumer representatives, um, an ethics representative, an education representative and an independent chair. Uh, they're chosen by government and appointed by government. Um, so to the extent that there is currently an existing vacancy, um, that's a government role to fill. Great. And so advisors that are out there saying, I'd like to get involved, perhaps that's an email to Jane Hume. <laughs> it may well be. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, second one is... Uh, do you or does the FASIA board have the ability to decide on when the implementation will begin? No, again, the, the dates of implementation are as per the Corporations Act. So it specifies um, dates for the, the ethics code comes in on the 1st of January. You currently have a requirement to pass the exam uh, with a date that the government's looking at extending and, and a date for passing your education requirements. Again, the government's looking at extending that. Uh, for C operates within whatever the corporation's law specifies. Makes sense. So again, if there is a desire to have an extension of when uh, the 1st of January 2020 comes in, then that is a, another email to the government. It's, it's certainly not in my power. Excellent. And the last one is uh, a word that sort of sends the shiver down the spines of advisors is this concept of looking back, of this idea that... Um, that advisors can live up to the standards that they're expected of today. However, there is a chance that uh, they can, or, or uh, regulation may look back in time and say you actually haven't lived up to current day uh, standards five years ago, for example. So if we combine uh, the 1st of January 2020 as the time that it starts, and then we say, let's say another one, two, or maybe three years, until the code monitoring body comes in, um, is there a chance that there will be look back and are you able to say whether that okay. will happen or not? So in, in terms of that, so the, the code does become law from the 1st of January. So you, advisors, and, and it's remember, worth remembering the code applies to advisors, yes. individual advisors, relevant providers, rather than um, broad business structures. And I think there's a bit of confusion about that. So it's it's the code applies to the relevant provider as defined, which is essentially what you and I would call an advisor. Mm -hmm. um, so they must comply from 1st of January. But in terms of, you know, a drop dead, we're going to look back on what you're doing. A, FASIA doesn't supervise the input. FASIA writes the standards and presents it. So that's beyond our scope to do that. Yep. Um, ASIC, I think, today put out a press release saying that, yeah. saying that they'll be taking a facilitative approach up until the point that the disciplinary body comes in, which effectively is going to replace what was a code monitoring body. Yes. So to me, that's a really sensible approach. Yeah. So basically, my interpretation was they don't plan on coming down too hard on, on anyone and they will facilitate, it looks like, because the expectation was that the licensees will do the training. So... What my interpretation of, and let me know if this is what you feel, is that ASIC have now put up their hand and said there's a gap in the market. We can see we're happy to work with existing infrastructure until the code monitoring exists. Which is the way I've read it. And I think it's, if you think about the way, if I put my old Prudential hat on, when you bring in a new standard, you generally say, okay, here's the standard. It takes place from today. Demonstrate how you're going to comply with it. And you recognise that people will need to make change. And 
the announcement ASIC has made today has actually given advisors time to make that assessment over how do I sit against the code today and in the lead up to the code monitoring body coming in, what changes do I need to make to demonstrate compliance when it's up and running? So I think for, for those advisors who've been really nervous about this coming in on the 1st of January, it's, it's a positive announcement from ASIC for them. Yeah, that, that was my interpretation as well. Um, it's also really good to hear ASIC come in and say something because um, as we started this conversation, uh, FASIA is all about building trust in consumers. And so every advisor that I've spoken to, and I'm sure you've heard this, everyone agrees with the intent and, uh, and, and how the benefit to the end consumer will, will be a, a far more superior outcome uh, than if it doesn't. Let's, let's say that. Let's say it's real binary as in, yes, it's going to be better for advisors, uh, sorry, for clients once, once this uh, comes in. Um, and then the only sort of nervousness that follows is the fact that advisors are really familiar with working within compliance frameworks to listening to the, new, the latest uh, you know, regulations that are getting handed down. Um, and they're very used to uh, getting told what they've done wrong because of an interpretation or a word. Or, and so advisors are sort of very much taught to be overly concerned as to anything that's ambiguous. And uh, the only, I, I guess I could summarize the fear that advisors have had is not so much uh, the, the purpose of FASIA. It's more so it's those bits in between, the gray areas, which then give at a very uh, intense reading of it, and we'll go through these, a, a horrible sort of outcome, right? And, and sort of, you know, the media and, and everyone has sort of like jumped onto that because it, it is a worst case scenario that does need to be considered. Um, but now that ASIC has sort of put their hand up and said, we hear you, we're willing to, to come in alongside FASIA here and start uh, providing some extra guidance. Thank God it's before the 1st of January 2020. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of in a little bit of a better mood than I was, say, yeah. yesterday. Yeah, I, and I think that's a fair point to make. And we heard, we've run a number of consultation sessions with the guidance coming out. And it was clearly a point that was coming through that, that people were nervous about that 1st of January drop date and and I can stand there and say that this is how I would put it into play um, but it's good that, that the way that ASIC have come out and spoken I think gives support to what we what FASIA has been saying and it also presents um, both FASIA and stakeholders with the opportunity for more consultation um, and to put together more guidance in areas that people actually genuinely feel they need it yeah um, and that's been the purpose of what we've been doing over recent weeks excellent who will be a part of the team that will write the additional guidance? So the guidance, right, well, so FASIA has the role. Yep. Um, we have, generally, we have some quality staff with the skill set that will write it, and but the board will be ultimately responsible for approving. But it works through um, a genuine process of consultation, um, considering the, the responses that are put to us by industry and by consumers and by regulators and, and everyone with an interest in the field um, to produce a set of guidance that we think will help and that's the aim for where we're going. So because what you, you're you trying to achieve is a pretty complex thing, right? I mean, I'm, that's probably an understatement, but you're, you're tying in consumer, advisor, ethics, education, all in this one uh, you know, outcome that you're trying to achieve. Um, can we go through maybe the really operational, almost boring side of how this code was written in the first place. So is it that there are staff, perhaps uh, X APRA, perhaps X ASIC, I'm not sure, but are there staff that are sort of sitting down and going, okay, these are the problems that we see that we've been allocated to fix, and this is the methodology. So, and then once that's written, it's handed to you and the board, and then you and the board discuss it, and then I guess strike some p bits off, add other bits in, 
and then massage it until you're happy? I mean, is that how yeah. it's happened? Um, so, having not been there at the very beginning, it would be, of it would be quite wrong for me to say exactly <laughs> what happened because I would be pretending to be somewhere that I wasn't. But in terms of since, the, since I've been involved, so what we had was a set of draft standards when I arrived that went out to industry to stakeholders for consultation and we received a good amount of consultation coming back. We have the, te the team in the office distills that down into into these were the the um, the main points that have come back. Here are the submissions that back them up, which and based on that, we're suggesting that these are the areas that we need to consider amending and changing. Right. Which ultimately gets presented to we have a standard. You know, we have obviously subcommittees within the organisation that go through that and ultimately make recommendation to the board, which is the way you would I think expect it to work, with the board ultimately signing off on on what goes out to the market. Right. Um, let's touch on that because uh, the, the associations have said to an extent they, they haven't been consulted. Uh, FASIA has said we, we did consult. Mm. I guess considering um, both sides are, are in disagreements, maybe can you answer why they would assume or, or, yeah. or why would they argue that they haven't been consulted? Okay. So I, I think... In terms of consultation, and I think I've made a number of speeches since I arrived that talk about a great chunk of my life is consulting and meeting stakeholders and talking to them about their issues with our guidance or with the code, and that informs what we do. In terms of what consultation, formal consultation we've done, so in terms of the code coming in in the first instance, that went through two rounds of broad stakeholder consultation before it was promulgated in February. Post that event, it's clear that people are seeking further guidance and we've met and I call consulted with these groups on regular occasions to get their details on what they'd like to see guidance on. We've then produced what I would say is the first cut of the guidance and we've presented it to everybody at the same time so that everybody has an equal opportunity under consultation to respond. Um, I think some of the what the associations are concerned is that they they probably felt they wanted to see it earlier. Right. Right. But we've made the decision that the, the fairest method of consultation is to give it to everybody at the same time so that you hear all the balanced views across the board rather than particular groups on the first go. Yeah, I can definitely see both sides of that. So you're, you're attempting or, or wanting to achieve as much transparency as possible. And also from the association's point of view, they would like to produce some level of preparation so that they're able to I guess maybe deliver it back to the industry um, once it's been through their hands so okay I, I can but, sort and, of but in you stand back in our seat as, as for SEA that our responsibility is across the whole stakeholder group sure and so the aim is to be fair across that whole group yeah I, I mean I, I completely understand um, I guess it's the um, the AFA and the FPA especially, the, the largest two, I guess have always um, been responsible for delivering the messages to the industry as a whole. So perhaps it's um, maybe just a um, non-conventional nature, perhaps, which is maybe why they have uh, been disappointed, I guess would be the right word, in, in how it was released. Yeah, I guess, I mean, maybe, yeah, I don't know, maybe that's the view of how they would like it done. Um, I've certainly come from a world that when you consult, you consult with everybody at the same time. Yeah. Um, and I still think that's the right way to do it. It actually doesn't mean their voices aren't being heard. Um, we're certainly inter interacting with them regularly. And their feedback will be brought into this consultation process. Cool. Um Commissions and asset-based fees. Mm. This is uh, this is one that's grabbed a few headlines. This is the one that you know, at, at its worst interpretation, um, would mean that from first of January, anyone that's receiving any kind of commissions and asset-based fees uh, is breaking the code. What's your uh, what's yeah. your answer? So our answer to that, and I think we've been pretty solid on it, is it's there is no blanket ban on any form of income. So what we've, we've said is, in terms of income, and, and there's, there's two points to it first. First, you've got to work out who the income's being paid to, because remember, the code applies to the individual advisors. Mm -hmm. 
to the extent that something is the structure of a broader business that's outside of our remit do you mean say something like an accounting yeah or well, even you know if if you have an advice business yes that's charging the fees etc that's the business that's not within the definition of what the code applies to under the corps act the code applies to relevant providers so it's looking at the remuneration of those providers oh right so what and sorry if i'm being a little bit slow here but what you're saying is uh that there's no limitation on what the business or the corporate authorised rep can receive, but uh, the individual advisor, um, or perhaps if I was to even interpret it more, um, commissions uh, can be earned by business, but it's not good form to be incentivising the advisors with the same commission structure. So... That's to the heart of where you're going to. Yes. But what we've said is, and we're we're trying to make it clear in the guidance, is because something is a commission, doesn't ban it. Sure. Because something is an asset-based fee, doesn't ban it. What you're looking at is, does that remuneration lead you to acting in the best interest of the client? Does it lead you to be able to demonstrate compliance with the other standards within the code? And is it not inducing you to do something against all of that? If that's the case under our code, it doesn't. it's not a conflict by the definitions that we've applied under that code, and you can act. If, however, for example, you are always going to the same person because you get money off them that you don't get off anyone else, and that product's not the best product for someone and it's not in their interest and it's not representing value, that would be an actual conflict and you should not act. Fully agree. And no one's going to disagree with that because that would be a horrible outcome for the client. Mm. Um, so common examples of this would be, um, let's say, property. Yep. Is that, that, that would be a common example. Um, uh, one of the interesting things, and, and I've been thinking about this, is, and funnily enough, ASIC sort of jumped onto the front foot with this in their media release today. Um, in regards to the unintended consequences because, and I'm sure that this is not the intention of FASIA. However, it's been interpreted by some pretty large licensees as the intention. And that is um, in regards to, let's say an advisor and let's say you're a mortgage broker. Now let's say I've been working with you for 10 years and let's say I know that over the last 10 years my client's consistently come back to me and go, Stephen was the best mortgage broker. I'm so happy I worked with him. Because as a professional service, even the people you recommend reflects onto you. Um, And so what has happened is with a reading of the FASIA guidelines is that there are some licensees that are saying, what that means is you can't refer to other specialities. Um, And then a strange little, I guess, uh, addendum to that is, but technically you're still allowed to refer internally. So then what's occurred, and this is probably the only time I've seen the unintended consequence out of of the reading I've done, is uh, the end result is that uh, you end up with almost a, a need to create a vertical integrated business to ensure that you're within the guidelines uh, and realistically, I'm sure that's not what you guys are after. No, and that's, I, I agree, it's not the intention yeah. of what we're doing, uh, but that, that has come back to me a few times throughout okay. the consultation. So clearly it's an element that we need to think about in the guides about how to make it clearer. Um, what you're looking for is, is in the Code of Ethics is provisors to stand back and actually stand back and think about this piece of advice that I'm giving. Yes. And whether that's advice to invest in something or I'm going to refer you to something, is it actually meeting the best interest? Is it providing value? So the services and what I'm giving you is giving you value. Do you understand what I'm putting you into? Does it make your risk profile? All those things you as a good advisor would be doing, the code is codifying it for you. Yeah. What it's doing in terms of lifting standards is is moving people away from doing things just, I've always done it this way, to now let's actually stand back and think about under the umbrella of all those standards and those values, am I actually putting the client first in everything I'm doing? 
because that's the hallmark of a profession. Totally. Is that you put the client first, and when you work through all of that, if you meet all of those standards, you can act. Um, here's a sort of a, a, a left of center question. Um, is there any other profession that has a similar code as this? As in, as, it... as in like, uh, I went to the dentist not long ago, they're a professional service, and um, they did some work on, on my tooth. And do they have, or, or are you aware of any other sort of profession? So, well, I mean, you think about professions out there, uh, and uh, the hallmark of most professions is education, training, and ethics. Um, I was originally a chartered accountant many, many, many hey. moons ago, a long time ago. <laughs> um, it's had a code of ethics since forever. Um, yeah. Medical professionals work in the same way. So it's, it's actually a hallmark of what you do. Oh, right. So I guess, so in, in the medical profession, or I got a couple of medicine as doctors, they got their Hippocratic Oath, mm. essentially. Um, uh, is, I guess, is the distinction because you know, the FPA and the AFA, they had their code of ethics, but that was an industry body ethics rather than an industry-wide ethics. Is, is that probably the differentiation? Yeah, uh, and the strength of the fact that this code's, it, it's codified in law, which is... Right. I mean, a lot of the codes you'll see out there will be voluntary codes of some sort. Yes. But the Corporations Act was changed to actually make this code law. Um, which gives it a strength that you may not see in voluntary codes. That's but, interesting. Sorry. But it doesn't mean that the code is is any more difficult than you'll see in other places. If I just, as I said, if you look back and sit and look at the umbrella standards in here, if you're a good advisor, you're just going to go, I do that. 100%. Um, that probably nailed my question even better. Is there another profession where their code of ethics is in law? So there, there are some, there are professions around the world, yep. um, particularly in, in financial advice. There are others where it is codified in law. Right. Um, so it's not alone. Yes. Um, but it is part of what attracted me to Facina in the first instance. I have to be honest, and it gives it gives a strength to what this does. Yeah. And in terms of advisors being able to stand up to to consumers and clients and say we work within a field of ethics. We actually work within a field of legislated ethics, mm. which has got to give long-term, and I, I look at this as a long-term brochure. I know we, a lot of what we talk about today is the, the crisis of well, how's it work tomorrow. Yes. This is actually a long-term picture of, of where this profession goes to, and I think it's a real strength for it longer term. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a good way to think about it. I, one of the uh, conversations I had recently uh, was with Jim Stackpole. I'm not sure if you've heard of Jim. He's, uh, he's I guess, a, a strong thought leader in, in the industry. And he was saying that the rise of the consumer uh, means that, you know, the genie's out of the bottle in terms of what what people now expect. And so I guess to um, illustrate your point, you're saying that perhaps financial advice is on the bleeding edge of uh reform in terms of legislative ethics but potentially we're going to start seeing this more and more across the professions yeah i mean it's it's quite possible and but i in i think of it in terms of for this profession today and for consumers and what consumers want yes if if you think about it today if i'm a consumer meeting a financial advisor at this point i don't know without asking i don't know what the education background is I don't know what ongoing training you're doing. Um, I don't know what um, umbrella you, you know, of ethics you operate under. But if you look at the FASIA amendments, if, by the time we get to the end of the transition, any consumer who approaches a financial advisor will know that that advisor's met a minimum level of education. They will know that advisor has sat an exam to demonstrate they can actually put that education into practical play. They will know they're keeping their skills set up through a minimum level of CPD and they'll know they're operating under a legislated code of ethics that puts the client first. In terms of this industry becoming a profession, that's got to give more confidence to consumers long term and in my view ultimately has to be better for the industry in promoting itself. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a... Because one of the things that hasn't worked in terms of getting a good outcome for clients across the board is the concept of um, disclaimers. Um, The theory was, I guess, maybe a couple of uh, decades ago, the more information was in front of the client, the better the outcome because then advisors would be, I guess, forced to explain it and clients would then have informed decisions and we know that didn't work. Um, Have you ever looked at or considered, because as someone who, I guess I've been on this exact journey of Fazia for about five years, for as long as um, XY has been in existence, our tagline is to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. And um, the conclusion that I've come to is that the legislation, the Corpse Act, uh, refers to advice and and sort of judges advice based around product, which is the birth of the industry. However, um, as the profession has matured, it is now, as I mentioned earlier, quantitative, absolutely, but also qualitative. What do you want out of life? How do we help you achieve you know, what it is that you want to, in five years, 10 years, 20 years, um, and asking questions and sort of solving monetary problems between married couples that technically they probably could solve themselves, but they just need someone to come in and help them muddle through those answers and have the tough conversations. And it's almost closer to psychology than it is uh, investment advice not all the time but that is part of the job description and um, have has anyone sort of said this to you or or, or um, brought up the fact that perhaps even if it's not in this round but one of the things we could look to do would be to entirely separate product which is a majority of the problems and advice um, they haven't, but they have now. Um, <laughs> um, I, I guess to an extent that... that so if, in terms of all the, the product and the disclosure and all of that, it's it's not within that foresee remit for what we're doing. Yes. We're probably at that other end that you're talking about, which is that behavioural element and the, the understanding of the client. And if you if you stand back dispassionately and look at the Code of Ethics, you'll see there's a lot of that in there about understanding the client, their broader interests, making sure the product is the right product for them, all of that thing, which goes to the heart of what you're saying. So to that extent, I think there is a movement for us, it, it might be unintentional based on the question you just asked, but there is a movement from us in terms of that behavioural piece that I think fits nicely into the bit about understand, know your client, understand them, and give them a product that's appropriate for them. Yeah. One of the things, and it's, it still dawns on me how strong of a sentence this is, but some of the best advice doesn't involve any product. And, and realistically, changing someone's investment allocation and things like that would, is almost like not even necessary in, I guess, the first six months. Like, If you were to come to me uh, as an advisor, the best thing I can do is just get to know you and what is it that you want to achieve out of life? Because life decisions are money decisions and money decisions are life decisions. And find out, you know, what's your aspirations. And, and it's very close. It's probably closer to, you know, the life planning, for lack of a better term. And then once I get to know you a bit more and once you're more comfortable with me because you're entrusting your future right into my hands so once we've gone back and forth and I've educated you and you trust me and then we can actually start doing some of the more numbers based uh, stuff and that is you know that the interesting thing I guess about advice is you're never going to get the same experience from two different advisors what do you feel about the concept that um, because limited advice has has sort of popped up a little bit 
Um, how do you feel about the concept of a risk advisor who just wants to do risk? Are you comfortable that they don't need to provide full holistic advice? So we've tried, in the guidance we have made comment that we believe there is a place for that sort of advice, and there is. Yeah, of course. But with the point we've made is that in doing that, you need to have enough of an understanding of the client to know that that piece of advice is right for them. And I suspect that given the feedback we're getting, that's a piece of guidance that we will need to work on what that looks like. Yeah. But it's certainly, there's no intention through what Fasi is doing to take away that type of advice because we do recognise in there, and we've tried to give some case example that shows when that's appropriate. Um, but we have heard that you know people would like to hear more on that, so that's certainly a piece that's coming back to us. Um, maybe there's something around the name Financial Planner. Perhaps if someone is a risk advisor, mm. perhaps there may be scope to differentiate themselves so if i go to a podiatrist and i need my skin looked at you know i know that i'm going to the wrong person um so there might be room or scope to actually use different terminology yeah i so in terms of the way we write it i mean we're, we're sort of limited by the definition on the corpse act which uses Certainly. uses relevant provider which is an interesting <laughs> term in itself yeah um yeah. so in trying to translate that into a word that people understand better we've tended to use advisor but it does recognize there are a range of different advisors and different types out there it's always a challenge in what you're doing is to produce one piece of legislation that fits right across that that broad spectrum oh yeah and that's an area that we spend a lot of time on trying to determine it it's similar to the exam that's been run when a lot of the feedback was how can you do an exam for everybody when there are a whole range of specialists out there. So we've gone to a great extent to write an exam that will test the competencies of an advisor regardless of their specialist type. And uh, to date, the results are showing that we seem to have managed that in that it's, it hasn't mattered which group you're coming from, the pass rates are strong all Excellent. the way through. Um, so we do bear that in mind. Um, I guess in a way it's difficult to write a, a piece of guidance that then lists the 20 different types of advisors just so that everybody feels like they've been mentioned it's trying to find a term that fits reasonably across everyone yeah but acknowledging we have in in our mind each of those groups when we're trying to write do you think do you think a part of getting more trust from consumers and delivering a better outcome for them because ultimately that is everything that we're discussing it is making it easier for the consumer to understand who they're speaking to before they're speaking to them. So uh, if someone is a holistic advisor, there may be scope to actually start calling them holistic advisors. And if I need insurance, maybe there's scope to actually start calling them an, an insurance advisor. Um, and so you are certainly in a difficult position when the legislation gives you terminology that is not used by anyone and then it's your job to then uh, um, interpret that. However, maybe um, maybe this is the right time to sort of sit down and go, actually, we're not just doctors. We are surgeons and cash flow specialists and um, there are differences. And so... Yeah, maybe um, yeah. maybe keep that in mind. I will, and to, to an extent there is, I guess the code to an extent sort of deals with that in terms of um, the sections around being competent to give the advice you're giving. So part of it is, in my mind, would be explaining to the client, I am a specialist in this, and, and you know this is sort of goes to the limited scope and I can give you advice, but if, if you need advice in other areas, then it's not for me to do that. We need to go to someone who's got that skill set. So... I think to an extent that does that, um, but in terms of all the different terminologies, it's it's definitely something we'd need to think of. Yeah, no, I know. I can only imagine you're probably getting uh, suggestions left, right, and centre. Um, that's basically all the questions that I had. Uh, is there anything that you would like to share to to the advisors? You know, considering we're five five or so weeks out from January 2020, is there a message that you you would want to yeah. send them directly? No, look, only just to... There's a lot of noise out there about the code. 
at present. But I just encourage advisors to read it and then just stand back and think about what you do today and how much of that code you actually cover off. And I think if you do that, a lot of that fear will dissipate because a lot of it is what I would expect a good advisor is already doing. Then think about, okay, well, what bits are in there that I actually might need to make some change on? And based on the announcements we've had today, that there is time to do that. So do that in a calm fashion and think it through. Um, At FASEA, we will continue to listen to what people are telling us and continue to think about guidance that can come out. The, The beauty of it being a guidance note is it's not locked away in a piece of law that is really difficult to change. It's something that can move and adapt as we learn, and and we will continue to do that. So we continue to encourage people to feed back to us on it. What is the best way to deliver feedback? So there's um, any number of ways, but if you you want to come directly to Fasir on our website, when you open it up, you'll see a nice big inquiries button in the (laughs) right-hand corner. Yeah. Um, Come through that, um, and all suggestions we received are read, and we take them into account, and we will respond. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Cheers.